Awesome. Well, I grew up in Connecticut, freezing cold Connecticut. And while I was up there, I was looking for a place to move that would be warmer. And I found it. It's pretty warm today. Um, I was looking for a place with history that was a little different than mine um, growing up, you know, on the East Coast, an English, uh, former English colony. And so I was looking into, you know, maybe Charleston or Savannah because I wanted to be warm, but their history would be the same. And so I found out about New Orleans and I started reading and it was like French and Spanish and Catholic and Irish and Germans and, and I wanted to find out more about that. And so in 2004, I you know, saved up some money, I packed up my car and I moved down here. And I got here, unfortunately, a year before Katrina, the storm. Um, but you know, when something like that happens, you really find out how much you love a place when you're willing to return to it. I came back as soon as they would let me. Um, and I love New Orleans so much. I have a, a minor in Louisiana studies. I've taken tons of history classes, archaeology, historic preservation. Um, I just, I love telling people about it. So I'm really excited about this new medium. Um, normally it's in person, but that's of course been difficult. So I'm super excited, you guys. It's awesome. We're lucky to have you here today. Oh, I'm lucky uh, you guys called. I think we're all really excited for uh, being able to, to see the, the, the Garden District through your eyes. So. It's going to be great. I'm so excited. Oh, very cool. Very cool. And and why is it the Garden District? Because we'd originally talked about maybe even doing a tour around the French Quarter. Uh, yeah. But, but you know, you're, we, we talked about it. Well, t tell us tell us your passions. Sure. You know, I mean, we're here. I specifically really so. The buildings of the French Quarter are amazing, right? We have some really old stuff. The oldest building goes back to the 1750s. That's the Ursuline Convent. That's our only existing French era building. But I mean, I really kind of fell in love with the garden districts because, um, you know, you get a lot of different immigrant groups coming in. You get the Americans coming in. This is post Louisiana Purchase, of course. And so you really have it's more diverse, I think, than the French uh, than the French Quarter. Um, you have French and Spanish colonial a little bit, but you have some American stuff. But it's kind of harder to find. Um, this we're going to be laying out today. I hope you guys are ready. We're basically going to go on a scavenger hunt, right? So my plan for this tour is we're going to uh, discuss three major types or styles. Excuse me. We're going to discuss three major styles, and we're going to go and figure out like what is a dental, and why does it uh, tell you what style it is? What is cast iron? What's that all about? And so hopefully, my hope every time I give a tour of the Garden District is that you guys will leave and look around the buildings of your home and be able to be like, oh, it's got dentals, it's Greek Revival, I get it. Oh, this has cast iron, it's Italianate, I get it. And so that helps you appreciate your own buildings even more so. Um, I mean, that's what I'm doing here. I just want you guys to appreciate buildings. I want you to know that every single one of them tells you something, so. Kristen shouts out, love hearing the plan. Thanks for letting us oh, know what's coming up. Yeah, it's no actually, problem. It's actually really cool. It's something that we don't necessarily do on these often. It's silly. It, we right. should do that. It makes yeah. a lot of sense to let everyone know what's coming. And thank you for that. <laughs> something that the future guides will benefit from watching sure. your tour uh, to learn what it is, uh, you know, what's what's coming. So that's really Awesome. Yeah, well, every building I've picked on this tour has, I mean, there, there's a, a reason why I picked that building specifically. Sure, the story might be good, but like it is giving us a really important part. It's a framework, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's what we're going to be seeing. Um, yeah. I love it. It's like my, what my, my grandmother uh, always used to say, uh, Lorraine Musha, uh, 95, oh. uh, and, uh, and as a young man would, would teach me uh, that famous saying about the fish, right? Uh -huh. That if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day, <laughs> teach someone to fish, they eat for the rest of their life. And I feel right. like you're teaching us uh, the fishing <laughs> of, uh, of I've never uh, thought of it that way, but yes, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm teaching you the keys behind your buildings and our buildings and everybody's buildings. So when you travel, you'll be able to, you know, maybe if you travel and you see a building from 1830s, 1850s, you, you know, Greek Revival is normally the one I talk the most about, but you'd be like, oh, this town was at least here in the 1820s, 1830s, 1850s. Um, and so it, it gives you already a sort of general idea about when the town was founded. It tells you a little bit about the history. Every building tells you that. You just really have to stop and look at it, um, which, you know, we're so busy in our phones. We're so busy thinking about our grocery list. We should be just observing a little bit more, I think. 
Michaela shouts out from Cologne. Wonderful. Ooh. I had art history in school. So, oh, wonderful. Uh, Kristen writes pumped. Yes. Uh, so uh, I, I think that the, the audience is excited. Guys, uh, if you have friends out there who you think would benefit from this experience right now, now is the time to share this video. Let them know. <laughs> if you're watching live, post it on your Facebook. Share it out from your, from your YouTube. Uh, hit that thumbs up button if you're watching on YouTube to like the video, uh, which will let more people find out about it. And please keep commenting, ask your questions. Uh, it lets uh, Katrina and me know that you're there uh, and that you're interested and that you're excited. It also lets the internet know that you're interested and excited. Sorry uh, to be like shouting at you as, I, as I'm just kind of like filming <laughs> That's you. That's okay. As, as you have That's to all right. To me. Um, and uh, Alba, uh, Alba, who's a, a, a regular, it's always great to see Alba. Thank you, Alba, for joining us again. Hi, Alba. Uh, so nice to see a young person oh. uh, appreciate the history <laughs> of a very unique city and be so knowledgeable. Oh, I think you just got, thank like, you. Well, I can quit now. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I hope you guys enjoyed. <laughs> thank you, Alba, for that. Um, well, we've got. Seven minutes past the hour. Let's okay, you want to get started? Yeah, it's great. Awesome. So, welcome aboard, everybody. Um, one of my requests, honestly, without Chris prompting me, is please ask any questions you could think of because I like to keep my tours always as a discussion, less lecturing. You know, I like to keep them kind of casual. I mean, it's academic information, but they're casual tours. We are friends. Um, I like to start my tours with a brief little intro to New Orleans history. I want you guys to all sort of just know the background of this city before we start talking about what we're going to talk about. So. This was, of course, the home to many different Native American tribes, right? We have the Chickasaws, Choctaws, Tunicas, Chapatulas, and then in 1682, a Frenchman named La Salle sailed down the Mississippi River. And when he got down towards the bottom, he stuck a flag in the ground and he claimed all the land drained by the Mississippi River for France. Now, that's not just the banks of the Mississippi River, but it's all the tributaries. So it's basically the Appalachian Mountains to the Rocky Mountains from Canada, which was French, all the way down here to the Gulf Coast. So that's a lot of space. Now it took about 20 years before he started getting settlements down here. Two French Canadian brothers named Iberville and Bienville showed up. They settled Biloxi, Mobile, Natchez, Natchitoches. And then in 1718, little brother Bienville founded New Orleans. So if you saw those Mobile tours, that was before us. Anyway, the first 40 years were French. And during this time, I mostly think of it as an era of neglect actually make it here but the French king is sending over boatload after boatload of convicts so if you meet anybody and they're like actually my people have been here since the beginning you now have follow-up questions for them <laughs> I've only been here 15 years <laughs> just so we're all clear um, so they're having a hard time organizing they're not getting supplies then there's the French and Indian War or for you folks in Europe it's the seven years war during this war France and England are fighting for control over North America during this war, France lost Canada. They're afraid they're going to lose Louisiana as well. So they secretly give us a way to Spain. And that's how we became Spanish. Basically, the idea being that, you know, they didn't want England to have it. Spain and France, they were related. And so they'll give it to them. Once it becomes Spanish, things start looking up. We get trade with Mexico and Cuba. It's at that point that we start taking on a Caribbean identity, which if you spend some time in the French Quarter, you definitely feel that. Unfortunately, during the Spanish era, we also had two major fires that basically burned down the French Quarter. So everything there is built according to a Spanish fire code. Everything is built uh, out of bricks and plaster, that kind of thing. Um, that's why it looks like Puerto Rico, because it's built Spanish in the same time. Um, as we're rebuilding, Napoleon decides he wants Louisiana back, so he asked the King of Spain. And I always say ask the King of Spain, but I'm pretty sure there's a little more of this going on. And so we go back to France. Now, Napoleon's plan is two parts. One, get Louisiana back, easy peasy. The second part is to get Haiti back. Haiti had been a very wealthy sugar colony. It had been French. It had been known as Saint-Domingue. But just a decade earlier, the enslaved people had a revolution to create Haiti. And so they threw off their French rule and created this independent nation. Uh, Napoleon threw troops at it, but they won't become French again. And so as he's realizing, wait a minute, that Louisiana colony might not work out very well without Haiti, that's exactly when Livingston Monroe are sent by Thomas Jefferson to buy just the city of New Orleans. And Napoleon's like, look guys, I have a deal for you. Uh, if you want, I'll just sell you the whole Louisiana territory. You guys could just have it. And they were like, okay, that sounds good. And so Louisiana purchase happened in 1803. 
So the timeline of events is 1718 were founded, we're about 40 years French, 40 years Spanish, a year or two uh, French again, kind of. Um, Napoleon never took over, Spain was still running things, but in 1803 we become American and we've been American ever since. I tell you all of that just to let you know that today we are going to be looking at an American settlement. So this isn't French, it's not Spanish. It's all gonna be built post Louisiana Purchase. So this area, the Garden District, was originally the Lividay Plantation. It stretched all the way down the Mississippi River, which is just about 10 blocks behind y'all, <laughs> I guess. Um, and during, uh, in the 1820s, Mr. and Mrs. Lividay got a divorce. Mrs. Lividay got the property, good on her. She didn't want him to have it. She didn't want to live here anymore either. So she sold it to American speculators and they took her small, you know, long linear uh, plantation, added it to other ones and created this separate city of Lafayette. And so this was a separate city from New Orleans. It was a suburb to New Orleans for about 20 years or so. This is where the wealthy people came to that wanted to get out of the city. And so we're gonna be looking at Charleston and Savannah today. We're gonna to be looking at building at the 1830s, 1850s. So right now I'd ask if you have any questions about any of that, you guys are all set for jeopardy. <laughs> Should it ever be New Orleans? <laughs> That was so great. Thank you for awesome. that. That's such a great historical intro. And now I feel like I really understand uh, the history of the place that we're going to be walking around in and the context that these buildings were actually built it's, in. It's which tricky. Is super valuable. Thank you for that. Awesome. Well, uh, that's what I do. <laughs> I like to teach people history. <laughs> so if you guys are ready, we're going to move over here. Sure. Across this street. Cross this street. We're gonna cross right here. Sounds great. I'll follow you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I like to stop right over here. Perfect. So we're good. Everything looks fine. Perfect. So. When you talk about architecture, you're gonna talk about two things, type and style. So type is the general layout of the building. So behind you, we have a ranch house. I'm sure a lot of people, at least from the United States, know what a ranch house is. That is the type, that's the floor plan. It's single story, it's linear, that kind of thing. That's the type. Now across the street, sorry. This house has two stories. This is strictly residential. This has two names. Sometimes it's called a double gallery house because those two beautiful porches and sometimes it's referred to as an American townhouse. Now when you're down in the French Quarter, you may notice Creole townhouses. They have commercial down below and apartments at the top. But here in the wealthy American section, you're not gonna work out of your houses. And so these are strictly residential buildings. Now style is going to get a little bit trickier. Style is the decorative features that lets you know when a building's built. So in, uh, we have three major styles that we're gonna talk about. The first major style is Greek Revival. It runs 1830s to 1850s. Then we have Italianate that runs 1850s to 1880s. And then we have Queen Anne that runs 1880s to 1910. That beige house right there with the white trim, that's a pretty good example of what Greek Revival generally looks like. It's very boxy, it's very plain. It has boxy columns, it has rectangular windows, it has dentals, those are those little squares up in the roof line that look like teeth, but generally it's a very simple style. Then this house, right here that we started with, the, two, uh, the double gallery or the American townhouse, is where it actually gets tricky. This house is going to have features of both revival and Italianate pieces in it. This is called a transitional house. So on the Greek revival side, we're going to have rectangular windows, as we just mentioned with the other house. And then I need you to pay special attention to the door. We have what a Greek key door. So there's the red door, there's a spider webby stuff around it, 
That's not what we're looking at. We're looking at the big white door frame. It's wider at the top, then it indents a little bit, and then the legs flare out as you come down towards the bottom. I hope everyone could see that because that's going to be on the test later, guys. You got to know what a Greek key door is. That's going to tell you Greek revival. Then we have all this beautiful cast iron here. That's going to be Italianate. So when this house is being built in 1855, I'm sure the homeowner is like, look, I like what we've been doing with Greek Revival, but cast iron just came out and we really like that too. So that's what we have. Now we're going to cross the street so we can get a real good look at the ironwork. It's a fantastic house. Got it. Mardi Gras beads out? <laughs> yep. <laughs> we're still a little sad we couldn't do our full Mardi Gras. Yardy Gras. Yardy Gras. Yeah, we did do that, and that was exciting. I had a lot of fun with that for sure. Now, I want to bring your attention to this fence right here. So, a lot of times when people talk about wrought iron and cast iron, um, they might use the same words. They might mix up these words, but these This is wrought iron. Wrought iron is where you take the iron, you heat it up, and you bend it into shape. When you look at this, I hope you can sort of think, like they, they hit it with a hammer on an anvil, that whole thing. See it in there, mm -hmm. all that. This, Just. all of this. This is cast iron. And then all of that on the gallery. Cast iron is um, where you take iron, you heat it up, and you pour it into a mold. That's the only way you can get this kind of detail, is by casting it. And so when cast iron comes out, People are so excited about it. In some cases, especially in the French Quarter, they rip off their old wrought iron galleries and put cast iron on. Now, you could get it locally in New Orleans. We do have foundries here. You could import it from New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore. You're importing a lot of building materials from the Northeast. You're getting them out of catalogs. And um, I think it's really interesting to consider that only the foundry with this pattern, with this mold, could make this specific piece. So I'm not entirely sure about it, but I'd like to believe that people knew where this came from when they saw it. Wow, Shay, that's really interesting. I've never, I've actually, and I've been, you know, in Charleston, Savannah, I've been looking at a lot of wrought iron and cast iron mm -hmm. uh, fences and, and gates and such, but I've never seen one where it was integrating yet. Yeah. Where you'd have the wrought iron and the cast iron the cast iron added to the wrought iron aspect yeah. of it and, and mixing like that. That's really fascinating. Well, you know, wrought iron is much more durable and it's stronger. Cast iron is really, I mean, it's susceptible to rusting, but it's also really brittle. So sometimes as we come along, you'll notice you get broken pieces and that's going to be cast. Um, so I'm, it's, it's, really, it's really sad, but it's a very uh, brittle, you wouldn't think iron could be brittle, but actually yeah. it is in this case. That's why we sure. replaced it with steel eventually. Right, right? exactly. <laughs> anyway, we're going to walk this way to our next house. Does anybody have any questions about what we've talked about? We've got wrought iron, cast iron, Greek key doors. I have a question for the, for the audience. Oh, what do you uh, got? If you guys are, uh, uh, where, where you're living now, where you are, it's, you know, one of the powers of this live virtual experience is that you're all over the world right now. Uh, what about your towns where you are? Are you, are you, do you have cast iron and wrought iron? Is that part of, uh, of your city's history as well? Uh, be curious to know. Yeah, I mean, there's tons of places. New York City used to have buildings that would look like this, but they've been torn down to make way for skyscrapers. And I find that fascinating. Now I want to show you this house across the street. Sorry about all the traffic guys, but this is going to pay off, I promise. This is a Center Hall Cottage. Really located front door, you're going to have a hallway. That is the type. Tell Yeah, we could go across the street and look. Um, so that is the type. Um, typically, the French and Spanish don't really do hallways because they think it's a waste of space, but um, the Americans really like putting hallways in. They are really interested in privacy. And so that's an interesting cultural difference, for sure. Um, as for style, this is another Greek Revival Italian A transition. So on the Greek Revival side, we have dentals over the door, those little teeth. We have 
pointed, uh, excuse me, we have uh, triangular pediments on the windows. We have um, a very symmetrical, boxy look all together, but emerging the Italianate details, it, of course, include the cast iron and the double brackets above every column that you see up here. As soon as you start getting curving pieces, that's going to be Italianate. And this house was built in 1853. It's one of the earliest houses in this neighborhood. Trying to uh, draw and circle elements oh, as you mentioned. Oh, that's it. fantastic. And uh, I'm doing a very average job of it uh, <laughs> this time. That's all right, it's better than nothing. <laughs> exactly. Let's move on to the next house. Is that, are those, is that, a, is that a pineapple supposed to be? You know, people say it's supposed to be a pineapple. I've also heard that it's, uh, people have said it's artichokes. People have said it's um, the seed pod from a magnolia. It looks more like that, actually. So, too. I mean, that's what it looks like to me as well. But I've heard people say other things, you know, pineapples for hospitality, etc. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, cast yeah. iron. <laughs> right, cast iron. Now here, I want to show you this cute little house. Adorable. Yeah, so this is called a single shotgun house and it's called this because technically you could fire a gun straight through the house. All the interior doors line up. Now you don't need to fire guns in your houses, uh, but instead it's a great way to keep things cool. So don't forget for a moment that we built all this stuff before we started to get air conditioning. And so we have to use what I like to call architectural trickery to keep things as cool as possible. And so you're going to open up all your doors and create a breezeway, hopefully. In August, there is no breeze. Inside, the ceilings are 10 to 16 feet high in these houses. And that's because heat rises, so you're gonna want it up there. Um, notice the porches, that's gonna be very handy as well. You want some shade on your property. And then if you notice how high this house is raised up, this house um, sits on brick pilings and underneath the house there isn't anything. There is a crawl space. You can see this sort of um, this ventilated area underneath. And so I never want to complain about cold weather to people that live elsewhere. But man, when we get a cold snap, our houses being built for summer are very cold. Mm. Um, a couple weeks ago we had a cold snap and gosh, my house didn't get much higher than 50 degrees with the heater running the whole time because it's so drafty. It's built drafty on purpose. Right. Uh, so. Douglas uh, writes, in Chicago lost most of its architectural ironwork during the Great <gasps> Fire. Yes. Some of it remains in the outlying neighborhoods. Thank you, Douglas Neff, uh, That's for that That's a great point. I went to Chicago um, in this, this fall and I was surprised at how new a lot of your buildings were. Because mm. um, when you see new buildings, that means something Recently, um, something happened there. And yeah, your Chicago fire completely devastated the area, for sure. I think I've got like a foot on you, man. Right, yeah. How tall are you? I'm five even. Five even, I'm six <laughs> five. So, so pardon me, my head trying to get into the frame. Um, uh, 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 Alba noticed before that there was a Tudor rose on the gate uh, with the wrought, oh. iron, the wrought iron mixed with uh, uh, the yes. cast iron. Isn't it beautiful? And I have a question, uh, actually, I'm just gonna point it up. Uh, Sure. Come on, phone. Uh, it's my, my fingers are humid. Yeah, it's damp here. Um, I was going to ask, in, yeah, the, what you got? Uh, in the overhang in the porch, mm -hmm. um, again, I see that kind of hint blue, which, uh, yes. which is so cool. But what are those, what are those round holes oh, there? Oh, yeah, those are cast iron vents. They're, it's yeah, to, they're to, to vent air, out the attic. Out the, exactly. The attic. Yeah, everything Very we cool. do with our architecture in this time period is about keeping things cool because we have nine months of summer or so. Wow, okay, cool, very cool, yeah. thank you for that. Do you notice the brackets that appear to be holding up the ceiling of the porch? Um, these are bracketed shotguns. These are late Italianate, early Queen Anne style brackets and you're gonna find them all over the city. They were very popular, again, ordering them out of catalogs. They're coming from all over, but I mean, if you head in the Irish channel, you're gonna find tons of them. Um, they're, they're just super fun. Ah, very yeah. cool. Let's move on. Yeah. 
What's the difference between like a, a truss and a strut? Ooh, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, well, we have like the rafters and... Just, yeah, well, just for how the, the support works inside. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to ask No, no, that's okay. I like to... Well, now I'll have to research it, uh, <laughs> which my, is my always mom, good. My mom's watching from Kingston, New York. Oh, wonderful. Which was the first capital of New York State in 1777. Oh. Uh, with many old buildings, but right, uh, the British burned most of them, unfortunately. Oh, right. I mean, uh, and that's so. the history, right? So that's telling you that story if you're missing. So like with us... Right, we would have had tons of French era buildings, but they all burned, except for one, except for one. Oh. Um, so, I mean, that's telling you, when you come here and you're like, where are all the French buildings? You should be mm -hmm. expecting a fire or some sort of urban renewal project or, you know. Earthquake. Earthquake, you yeah. know, something there, that's written. The buildings are telling you that story. Mm. Now, I gotta show you beautiful Commander's Palace, guys. Um, if you get a chance, if you come to New Orleans, put it on your list. It's the best restaurant. No, it's number one year after year after year. But we have to talk about the architecture because, oh my goodness, this is um, my best example on the tour of Queen and style architecture. So we've talked about Greek Revival. It's really boxy and plain. And then as you get into Italianate, we got cast iron, we got curves. And then, boom, when you hit Queen Anne, it's just texture 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 so we have horizontal novelty board siding that's just that plain horizontal line stuff then we have the queen and style turret if it went all the way to the ground it would be a tower but it's just halfway so it's a turret then we have fish scale shingles instead of siding in some places then we have all that beautiful carved wood that's called east lake style carved wood and it's called that because it's named for these spindles for kitchen chairs and furniture and it was a handcrafted movement in England. You might be familiar with it as furniture, but when this mode of making things showed up to the United States, we started making it out of machines. You know, we started using machinery. And so Mr. Eastlake was actually very upset that we were calling this Eastlake because it wasn't what he was going for at all. I think it's super fun. Um, as for, you know, the color, this is a very famous color. Um, this building used to be white. I've seen photographs of it painted white. But when Miss Ella Brennan bought it, I think it was in the 1970s, she wanted everyone to know she was shaking things up. She was completely um, changing this place. And so she painted it this teal color. This is called Commander's Blue. So if you buy something of this color, you're like, oh, girlfriend, I got a new blouse. It's Commander's Blue. We all, we just know. Um, it's really wonderful. So please, please put Commander's Palace on your list um, should you ever visit New Orleans. As I was walking over here before, uh, a yeah. chef friend from Portland, uh, Maine, reached out. Oh, yeah? Uh, Moses Sabina and said, uh, uh, Commander's Palace, not just great for brunch, but on Friday, apparently, there's some sort of 20... It's lunch anytime. Um, you buy an entree and then you can get 25 cent martinis. They I mean, will cap you at three, okay, that's which is probably, probably enough. Yeah, they probably just don't want you falling down their stairs. That's a good <laughs> yeah, insurance company says no more than right, three. Right, three, that's it. I mean, they will probably serve you full price ones after that. Yeah, I'm betting. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and Very so cool. when you're ready, we're going to head this way next. Now, guys, some of you might be used to us having a slightly longer uh, experience together, uh, but today uh, the uh, the dance the dance calls. Yeah, it does. I'm so excited to yeah. <laughs> to wear a costume and look ridiculous and meet my dancing friends and show them around the Garden District as well. Um, by the way, all of these houses on the right hand side were all designed by the same guy. His name was William Ferret. He was an architect speculator, so that means he bought the land, designed and built the houses, and then he needed to sell them. One. So just as the Civil War is getting going, he's like, y'all, I have houses for sale. And everyone was like, yeah, we're busy. Yeah. And so um, he almost went bankrupt over this project. We still call this Ferret's Folly. They're so amazing. Um, it bums me out that we call it Ferret's Folly. Do not worry for a moment about William Ferret, though. 
he ended up doing just fine. His daddy was the mayor. This, he was doing this in his late 20s. Um, so I promise you, we're going to see something else he worked on, he designed. It's gorgeous, though. Yeah. And spring is the best time to be here. You really picked a good time. <laughs> yeah, as Chef flowers are said, blooming. Uh, when you can smell the crawfish boiling, you know it's spring in right. the Right, <laughs> exactly. For some of you, you might not have seen flowers in a while. <laughs> yeah, our friends from Canada. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Teague. Hey, Teague. Thanks for checking in. Teague says hello from Canada. Oh, hi. I love the towers on the blue building and 25 cent martinis. That's what's up. That's a good deal. <laughs> That's true. Well, we're going to stop right here so we can look at this beautiful house across the street. I'm spinning, I'm spinning, That's I'm all right. Spinning, That's all right. We're getting there. So this house across the street is really different from all the other stuff we've talked about so far. This is a Swiss chalet style house and Swiss chalets are those steep peaks on them are really good at <laughs> snow <laughs> removal. So we don't need them here. Um, but they were very fashionable at the end of the 1860s. So a couple of them showed up. And so that's how we got this one here. Now, normally a Swiss chalet would have stonework down at the bottom, but because we are an alluvial, excuse me, um, yeah, because we are an alluvial plain, um, we do not have stonework here. We don't have any stones or rocks or gravel or any of that. So to get around it, to still make it look very rustic, this house has um, bricks covered in plaster and they drew little lines in it to make it look like stone blocks. So if you can see it, I'm not sure how good the focus is, but um, you're going to find a lot of faux stone in New Orleans. You know, in, in some buildings, they also do fake graniting. They do faux graniting where they take bricks, they paint it gray, they even paint in little dots to make it look like granite. Um, that will sometimes happen. This house is uh, generally mentioned by tour guides yeah, this is Miss Bullock's house, and she's a nice lady. I'm so happy she's here. Sandra, if you're if you're watching right now, you can just come to the balcony just <laughs> yeah, for a just second. Just come say hi. Just come say hi real quick. <laughs> we really appreciate it. And Dr. Fauci, if you're watching, we could also, it's always nice to hear from you as well. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, John Goodman, if we're over by your home later on, you could come out as well. It's wonderful. Yeah, that'd Good be stuff. fine too. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to mosey Sandra. down. Bye. Good friend of ours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all best friends. She's well, just super busy. I mean, She's super busy. I mean, I actually live, I live down the street. I live in the Irish Channel, surprise, surprise. And um, yeah, I like to consider these guys my neighbors. You know, John Goodman, Miss Sandra Bullock. Um, they don't consider me. But um, <laughs> they're just very busy. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what I like to hope for. Um, but they could uh, not be so shy. <laughs> <laughs> Come say hi. Um, I live right down the street. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, gosh, what a pleasure it is to be doing this experience. Oh, it's with you. so fun. I'm so glad you called. This is really neat. Yeah. Although we do have to watch your time because I don't want an angry dance group. No, no, I don't, I don't want an angry uh, dance group a either. In my grave one day. <laughs> exactly. So I want to show you this house right over here. We're going to come down this street. This is one of my favorites. I mean, it's hard to have a favorite. They're all, they're all wonderful in their own special way. But this one really speaks to me. This is called the Robinson Family House. And the Robinson family were wealthy tobacco farmers in Virginia. And they wanted a house here in New Orleans because in the antebellum era, we were the second busiest port city in the United States. We were the gateway to Latin American goods. Um, we were the largest city in the South. Atlanta wasn't that big yet. Um, and so New Orleans was definitely the place to be. And so this family wanted to be here. So they hired my favorite architect. His name was Henry Howard. Um, Henry Howard came from Cork, Ireland. He was an Irishman. And when he arrived here in New Orleans, he worked on about two dozen houses in the Garden District. Um, so if you ever get to take a full tour with me, we're going to talk about Henry Howard a lot. It's good timing because um, Daniel Musha just asked, did many Irish immigrants or did
Exactly, definitely. That is a wonderful question. Well-timed. Um, Well-timed <laughs> is perfect. Uh, yeah. Um, anyway, yes. So basically, because of the port, you know, we were the second busiest port city. Um, and during the Irish potato famine specifically, um, you got a choice between New York and New Orleans. Oh. And so in the antebellum era, our population reached as high as 25% Irish. Wow, wow. Um, so we had quite a few. So that's why we're so disappointed that our parades are canceled uh, this weekend, because um, we normally do a, a really big <laughs> extravaganza for it, for sure. Um, yeah, tons of Irish people. Um, this house is another one of these great transitions. Um, as for Greek Revival, we have Doric columns on the bottom, we have Corinthians up on top, we have rectangular uh, windows. But if you notice, there's a curving gallery that kind of softens it a little bit. There's cast iron, there's double brackets over every column up in the cornice there. Um, if you notice on the arch, there's an arched parapet and an arch on the doorway. Um, you know, by this time, we've been doing Greek Revival for 20, 30 years, we're bored. The homeowners are bored, the architects are bored, everybody's bored. And so the architecture a little bit. That's a parapet up there at the top? Yep, that piece up at the top, that's a parapet, exactly. It juts above the roof line. Speaking of roof lines, this is one of the first houses in the area to have running water. They actually had a special roof put in that channeled all the water to the perimeter and then it would collect in cisterns in the attic and then you can use gravity to run water through piping in the house. That's amazing. Yeah, this house is late 1850s. Wow. Yeah, and it's amazing. And notice how big the lot is. Mm -hmm. um, this is a full quarter block lot. So this area, when it was developed, it was four houses per block. That's why it's the garden district. You know, you really get a chance to have a great garden here. Um, the French Quarter, um, by comparison, has 12 to 16 houses for, per block, and they have a lot of courtyards and, and architecturally. Am I wrong in believing that the, the secondary parts of the building are, are newer? It looks, it looks newer, So that it has one, a lot of the same uh, specific uh, you know, design elements to it. Yeah, uh, I had originally thought that it was a carriage house that had been converted, because that's a thing that they do, right? You have old carriage houses that you used to use, and now, of course, we have cars, so they convert them into uh, mother-in-law suites and that kind of thing. But this one has a very, very modern look to it. So uh, the windows specifically should be telling you all that something's a little different. Um, and so I'm not really sure. I'm going to have to look and in, in, look into that one a little bit more. For Teak, sure. Teak says the house is stunning. Oh, uh, isn't it? And on our way over here before Shannon, who also says there's no flowers blooming yet oh. uh, in Canada, oh. uh, we walked by this house and Shannon and I decided that we'd be willing to live here yeah. uh, and split it up and you know, take a floor <laughs> reach. Uh, we just, you know, we just got to figure out like a couple of the finance things. Yeah. yeah. Figure out the maintenance things. Uh, That's going to be the issue with one of these. I mean, they're expensive, but not as expensive as you think. And the issue is how much money you're going to put forth for maintenance. Kristen mentioned the magnolia tree out here is beautiful. Yeah, they're going to be blooming in uh, late April to May. Um, and nothing smells like a magnolia. It's so beautiful. So if you're planning a trip, <laughs> mm -hmm. you might want to come here late April, May. The um, gardenias, jasmine, um, magnolia, all that will be blooming then. Um, it's really, really special. And your tours run uh, all through the summer? I mean, even with yeah. the heat and humidity? Or do yeah, you, they do you do an early start to try to beat it? Or um, no, we, uh, we keep hydrated. Um, normally with, uh, <laughs> so I grew up in the Northeast, so I talk a little fast on the hotter tours. So we're able to wrap <laughs> them up a little bit earlier. Um, you know, it's really about gauging your guests and seeing how they feel about it. I make sure they have water. I make sure that they let me know. We have communication if they're feeling a little weird because, you know, people aren't ready for this. Um, please watch your step here. Um, this you know, is not because the roots are coming up. It's because the city is sinking around the roots. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that, I heard that, that. I heard that yesterday. I mean, I think it's a combination of both okay. things. You know, really the situation here is this is water and silt. 
And you know, this land was, I like to think of it as a gift given to us by the Mississippi River. Mm. So as the river came down, it dropped off its soil and that's what created the land that we have here. And so as time went on, we started building levees, we stopped the river from flooding and so our soil is not replenished. And then we started, um, of course, you know, pulling out the groundwater. And so our, our city is sinking a third of an inch every year. And so, yeah, it's quite possible that everything is sinking around the trees or the trees are just trying to, uh, uh, their tree roots are escaping, I doesn't, guess. It doesn't have to be one or the other. No, the I think so. I think so. I mean, it is treacherous though. If you see here, um, you got to watch your step for sure. There. <laughs> You know, sometimes I'll get folks that are just like, well, why don't you guys just fix the sidewalks? And it's, it's so much bigger than that. We yeah. would have to cut the trees down. No. And uh, that would be so sad. I wish we could just fix the sidewalks. <laughs> it's got to be a solution. So if you're an engineer, right. yeah, you're a civil work engineer on it. out there, you're, you're going to solve this problem. <laughs> it's just going to get worse. <laughs> For sure. Shannon says, uh, as soon as she gets that winning lottery ticket, wonderful. Then we're, we're, she's going to get the house and I'm going to dog sit. Oh, that's fine. That'd, that'd be great. That'd be fine. Right. Or if you can come over too. <laughs> that'd be awesome. I would love to. <laughs> we'll get your friend Sandra and John. Right. We'll get all our buddies. <laughs> so here we are. We've, if that was our house, they probably would come over. Maybe. They would. We're neighbors, right? We're real, maybe they'd be borrowing sugar. Maybe we would be borrowing sugar. Yeah, exactly. um, this is John Goodman's house oh, right oh, here. Yeah. Yep. Oh, you made it right on time. Um, so this is John Goodman's house, and this is another great example of Greek Revival Italianate transition. So I hope you guys can all see. As we've been discussing um, Greek Revival, but they're slender and paired, and that gives you a little bit more of a, a romantic feel, and so that's going to be more Italianate. We got cast iron, Italianate. We got dentals up in the top that look like teeth, but then we have double brackets with it. You know, you really sort of get this sense that, you know, in the transitional period, you're just throwing anything you could think at it. You're just putting whatever you want in it. It's not very formal, which I really kind of enjoy. You know, in, in the Greek Revival era, everything's going to look the same. And then as you transition out, you get a lot of really cool variances. And then when you get into the Italian era, everything's going to start looking the same again. So my favorite times are the transitional times. Mm. Also notice the beautiful green shutters and the blue ceilings on the porches. Uh, yeah. Everyone loves to talk about the blue ceilings on the porches. I've heard many reasons why we have that. Um, one reason being uh, it'll keep wasps from building nests there. Supposedly they think it's the sky. Then I've heard it'll keep birds from building nests there. And then of course I've heard it'll keep ghosts from coming in or maybe coming out. I'm not sure. <laughs> As you and Chef Jason discussed yesterday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, you also have those those are uh, uh, cast iron uh, vents as well. Up in yep. There. Sometimes those cast iron vents are now converted into light fixtures. Oh, cool. Beautiful. We have one stop left, and this is going to be the big one. I hope you guys are all ready for it. Payoff. Yep, the payoff. We're going to summarize. <laughs> We well, sneak in I right have here. to say, I, it, I, I find that us nutmeggers, us mm -hmm. people from Connecticut, the outsized impact uh, <laughs> in the U.S. And uh, <laughs> you always see it, and it's a consistent thing. Connecticut, small but strong, packed yeah. a punch, just like you, you know? <laughs> so, right. Um, you would never know that you were, that you were from, the, the, from New England other than you telling us. Right. Otherwise, I think that, that you were, uh, your, your blood, fl you know, flowed uh, Fleur de Lis Blue uh, <laughs> down here in New Orleans or something. Right. Uh, Teague asks, uh, um, what, uh, what is the main tree type there or types? Yeah. Um, Watch. Yeah. Um, well, so uh, the ones that you guys might be recognizing or, or seeing the most of are the live oaks. And uh, live oaks are the, these, the big trees that go very horizontally. They have big, long branches that stretch out. Um, 
lot here. We have palm trees, we have magnolias, um, you know, we can grow a lot of different things here. What I think is kind of a bummer though is that we cannot grow lilacs. That's like the one thing oh. <laughs> that really bums me out. If you look over there, we got some azaleas blooming, got some, uh, I mean, it's just about to happen with the flowers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you guys are probably about a week, a week or two early, exactly. Um, uh, Kristen asks uh, also just real quick, are we going please. to see Ann Rice's house? Or is that um, we here? are not. That's a little bit far. It's, it's down the street, but we have to stop right now. So I have to give you this last bit. Um, let me start with this pink house right here. Um, this is our best example of Italianate architecture. So we have the cast iron, as we've already mentioned. Now we have arched windows. That's different. Up at the top where dental should be, we now have corbels. And if you can't see it like on the front of the house, if you look on the bay, you'll be able to see what the corbels look like. Ah. Um, they have curving pieces on them. Notice also we're now talking about a bay. So you get a chance to pop things out, play with asymmetry, that kind of thing um, in the Italianate era. So the reason why we're stopping on this corner is because right now we have all three major styles in one spot. So on the left, we have Greek Revival. It's really boxy and um, you know, it's very imposing. It's very strong. It's got the columns. It's very boxy. It's very plain. There's a lot of math and a lot of rules here. Then as you turn to Italianate, it's more romantic. We have cast iron. Um, we're softening the rules. It's a more delicate look. And then finally, right here, we have Queen Anne. And so with Queen Anne, the rules are gone, right? Mm -hmm. The windows don't match. The, uh, the roof heights are all different. There's tons of asymmetry. <laughs> Symmetry is gone. Um, and so I think it's really important to take a second to look at all three of these because this is what this tour has been about all along. It's about trying to decipher the difference between all of them. And I know a lot of them are going to be transitional, but we do have this one moment where we have all three. Fantastic. Really great. I think you've done an incredible job of awakening our appetites for the architecture and, and the history that it represents. I hope uh, so. Both here in New Orleans and in our own homes. <laughs> and uh, as any great performer like yourself knows, always leave them wanting more. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and uh, I think it's been, that's really good. Can I, uh, I'd say first of all, guys, questions. Yeah. Now's your last chance because uh, Katrina unfortunately does have to run. I do. Or I'm going to get that dancing on my grave <laughs> thing. Um, as, you're, as you're getting this feed coming to you and you're waiting for those, I'm waiting for those questions mm -hmm. to come back. I have a question really yeah, quick. what do you got? On top of this Queen Anne building. Yeah. Uh, house. Um, what are those features on the roof line? That's a great question. Those are called coxcomb finials or rooster comb finials. And so you're going to want terracotta like um, tiles over the seams. So normally a roof, you know, has its seams and then you have the terracotta tiles over that. And so in this period, everything is very textured and very decorated. They don't leave any spaces of, um, you know, plainness. And so they're going to decorate those too. So those are called coxcomb. Yeah. Very cool. Wonderful. All right. Well, uh, uh, Diana says, super nice guide. Oh. She sent you a green heart oh. uh, for the holiday. Um, and um, while, we're, while we're just saying goodbye, guys, you know where the donate button is. Uh, and, um, you know, there's a couple ways that you can help. And the first one is, of course, is go ahead and hit that donate button, 100% of it. It's going to Katrina right here. Um, so uh, she's worked hard for this. It's for every minute that she's <laughs> spoken today, there's probably 10 hours of like research and studying and knowledge that goes into it. So uh, don't be shy, be generous. Um, you know, all the money that people have saved by not going out and traveling is the money the tourism industry hasn't seen. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very grateful to have your support. Um, Diana has a question. Uh, do you have wind vanes on the roof? You know what? Not many. Not many. In fact, I can't even think of any right now. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Uh, Shannon says, thank you. Alba, thank you. Um, uh, uh, just talked about the donate button. What else? Oh, if you haven't donated, hit that thumbs up button. <laughs>
comment right. if you haven't commented. Hit the share if you're on Facebook. All of that helps as well to help spread the word of Katrina's tours here uh, so that we more people that yeah. are coming to New Orleans can, uh, can find out about uh, this great this great time. And This is me, New Orleans Architecture Tour. So please look into us when you visit. Oh, Sorry. That's it's okay. We got it. Awesome. Um, so yeah, please visit New Orleans and look us up and check out architecture tours. We'll give you a full tour. <laughs> well, I've, I've been on tours with uh, close to 2,000 guides over my lifetime. And I have to say that, uh, that you are one of the top uh, guides oh. out there. You're a pro and it was really enjoyable to spend this time with you. Get closer, oh. Dr. Fauci, no anger from us. And yeah. if you do me the honors and oh. hitting that end button in the top right hand corner. Sure. Bye guys. Love you guys. Take care. Bye, Velma. Oh, did I Almost. do it?